All right. Continuing on in Romans. Um, last week I kind of mentioned, you know, <clears throat> some of these sermons, you know, some we have to deal with some. Uh, when I approach them, they're kind of a heavy theological topic we've got to talk about. And others are kind of a, a kick in the pants topic we got to talk about. Um, and others are kind of a rah rah, you know, let's get going. Um, type of sermon, and that's how a lot of Romans 8 has been, you know, the rah-rah, exactly. you know, just, oh, because it's such an amazing <laughs> chapter. Um, but today's passage, we we, we got we kind of we got to have a, a dual kind of thing. We got a rah-rah message, uh, but we also have kind of a, a deeper theological thing we got to talk about as well in our passage today, um, which is good. It's good to dive into the deep things uh, of what God has for us. Um, last week we looked at, remember, our, our future hope. The, the, the future hope that God has promised for us. And, and I'd like to give us hope now, right? Because we know we have a, 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 that God is, will be glorified in the future. We'll receive our glorified bodies in the future. And that, you know, that can give us hope for living now, right? And, and, but, I don't know, like me, I don't know. I hate to say this, but I'm a little bit of a skeptic sometimes. I'll be like, well, that's all fine and dandy that's going to happen then. But what about right now? <laughs> I mean, give, give me some nuts and bolts help now, not just some theory that something's great is going to happen. I, I, I want some nuts and bolts. The assurance is now. Help now. Give me some help now. I mean, give me a few life now. Well, thankfully, God is very good. And <laughs> this passage we're going to get in today is exactly that. Uh, is the nuts and bolts of, okay, what helps us now, okay? The, the keeping our eyes focused on the future hope is good. And, that, you know, and that's what we need to be focused. But sometimes we're like, that's great, but how, how can I? It's easy to keep my eyes focused on there, but when, my, when I'm stuck in the mud here, how do I get out of the mud? You know, and, that's, and so this is where Paul is going to give us some great uh, help here in today's passage in Romans 8. Uh, we're going to be starting in verse 26 today. 26 through 30. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll, I'll take it slow on some of the note taking because I didn't have a, I had to get them all printed out because we didn't know when we were losing power. So I had to get them printed out before I had all my sermon perfectly sketched out yet. So I'll, I'll repeat my points a couple times for you guys so you can write down the points as we get there. Uh, but Romans 8, 26 through 30. And just after he gets done talking about the future hope we have of the future glory coming, he's going to pick it back up in verse 26. Let me pray before I start reading. Heavenly Father, we now uh, just, <laughs> I thank you, Lord, just for the, it seems like a spirit of joy here, Lord. It's just a, even when we're, oh, we lost our power, Lord, we come here and it's just to experience the joy as you are, you are joy. You are the source of all joy. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the, for the, the goodness we have uh, from you. So now as we turn to your, your, your word, we pray that we be filled um, with your word and your spirit be moving in us to convict us and, 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 and push us to do things in our lives, Lord, that your word commands us to do. Lord, open our eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, starting in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for, for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Hope you can tell from those last couple of verses what, what might be the heavy theological topic we have to have later on in the sermon. But uh, predestination, foreknowledge, we'll, we'll get to that 
of course. But let's jump back up here to verse 28. So we're going to, 26, sorry. <clears throat> we're going to see here, uh, you know how in my points I usually have a statement and then three points underneath it? So my statement I have is, for those who love God. For those who love God, and you could even say, you know, if I love God, you could write that in there too. For those who love God, the first point is the Spirit prays with us. The Spirit prays with us. And that's capital S, Spirit. The Spirit prays with us. Picking it back up in verse 26, where he says, it, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And in our weakness. Now, what's being said here about weakness, it's not saying uh, the Spirit is going to help us in those times when we are weak. It says, helps us in our weakness, which is our condition. It's who we are now. We are sinners in a fallen body. We are weak. So the this, this Spirit helps us in our weakness, which is now all the time, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so the Spirit just doesn't help us when we're weak. The Spirit helps us all the time. Yeah. All there. Helps us in our weakness. And more like one of the more specific ways of how it helps us in our weakness. <laughs> Over here, and also the weakness means, I mean, anything. It's, it's a physical weakness, emotional weakness, spiritual weakness. It means everything that comes from our fallen bodies. The Spirit helps us in that. And even when we don't know it. <laughs> when, when maybe when we're living lives that we think are apart from God, but if you've given your life to Christ at some point in your life, guess what? That Spirit ain't leaving. <laughs> so you may try to leave God, but the Spirit's still helping you. And so how does He help? And one of the ways is I love this. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. <laughs> Anybody here ever had trouble praying? Yeah. yeah. We talked about this a little bit on Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, well, here on Wednesday, you're going to hear some of this repeated a bit. But yeah, if, if you're like, I mean, I, I'm terrible at praying, guess what? Yeah, we all are. <laughs> In our fallen bodies, we're terrible at praying. This is what it says here. We, we don't know what to pray for. And thus, we, we have the Spirit. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So the Spirit intercedes for us. He comes alongside and helps us. He's an intercessor there that helps us with groanings too deep for words. Remember we talked about uh, last week the, the creation groaning, right? So he's carrying that groaning through here. I'm groaning. So, I mean, the spirit is um, kind of like, um, I almost say anguish, but it's going to look anguish for us. It, it, it longs to help us. It's groaning for us and helping us. Um, just as the creation groans, the spirit groans, just as we groan, the spirit groans for us. Now, a little side note here. Um, sometimes this passage is used to, to reinforce, to say, speaking in tongues. But if you notice, who's doing the groaning? Is it us? It's the Spirit, not us. So this isn't a passage that can be used to say, hey, this points to the Spirit having to speak in tongues. No. Because here it's the Spirit groaning, not us. Um, this is all about the Spirit. So the Spirit is there to help us in our prayer life specifically, interceding for us. He, uh, he uh, appeals <laughs> to someone for us. And this is what, I mean, if you want to see how bad we are, we need uh, two intercessors in our life. Because we have the Spirit here that just said, that's something, I'll be honest, I haven't really ever thought of the Spirit as being our intercessor. Because who do we usually view as our intercessor? Jesus, Jesus right? If we jump to verse 34, which we'll cover next week, and it says, and who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So that's the passage we all know of. Okay, that's Jesus that's been the intermediary for us before the Father. What Paul's saying here too is, guess what? The Spirit also is too. That's how weak and stupid we are. We, we need two parts of the divine trinity in order to help us speak to the Father. 
Now, that does not also show how much the Father loves us. <laughs> that two parts of the Trinity help us pray. And it seems for us that groaning is too deep for words. And then carrying it on to verse 27. And he who searches hearts. That's talking about God the Father there. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now this is, this is a beautiful picture of how the Trinity works in prayer. You have God the Father... He, he, he knows our hearts. He knows the, the <clears throat> is one who set the Spirit in, in us. And the Spirit is there praying for us, interceding for the saints according to the will of God. So we have the Father and the Spirit working together for us. That's great. <laughs> it's a beautiful picture. That's how they help us in our weakness. The Father and the Spirit working together to help us pray. You know, it's like, you ever had the time when you've n ever uh, n needed a lawyer in your life? I don't know, maybe a, something. Because what, what, what is a lawyer? A lawyer is an intercessor who comes on your behalf before the judge. You know, and, and like you look at the, the, the celebrities, you know, that there's like the, the big name price lawyers that are always in the news when the case comes up. You know, they have the biggest firms, you know, most people working for them, and they, they know the laws inside and out to try to finagle everything and get everything just right for the, for the, the, for the good of their client and really for the good of themselves, too. Um, you know, but the most powerful, the smartest lawyer, I mean, I really hate con 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 comparing the spirit to a lawyer, but, but to a point, intersection is kind of like that. And in that the Spirit and Jesus, as we see in verse 34, intercede for us. They come before the Father for us while we're in our weakened state. They're praying for us. They help us. So when, when you're in those, those tough times and you're thinking of, oh, yes, if I love Jesus, guess what? You have the Spirit in you praying for you. And that's not the Spirit as in the force from Star Wars. <laughs> this is a member of the Trinity that is in you, praying for you. Oh, okay, this is a big thing. So that's what he starts off with here. And the next point, in addition to the Spirit praying for us, we see that all things work together, all things work together for his good for us. All things work together for his good. That's a capital H talking about God. For his good for us. It's probably a verse we've heard a lot in verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. I'm going to get to the second half of that verse later. All things, uh, for, that, for those who love God, all things work together for good. That, that's a good thing. Now, this important is, <laughs> will, does that mean that everything is going to look good from our standpoint? No. no. This is God working his good according to his will. We keep inside. You know, this isn't, you know, this is the verses that prosperity gospels love to see. See, God wishes good on you. But good means money. He wishes to prosper. No, that's not what this is meaning. This is God wanting his good for us. Our, we, we, we don't have an easy life as Christians. But God wants to work through us in our lives. And what, why, doesn't he, why doesn't he want to work in us in our lives? To work together for his good so we can be, be presented holy and blameless before them. That's why he's working the good together for us, even though it may not seem good. And the other thing with this is we often, in our individualistic society, we take this verse to mean me, right? But if you look in this whole passage in 26 to 30, there is not a singular pronoun used. It's all us or those. It's all plural. So we've got to remember 
Then when he says he works all things together for the good for those who love him, think of the good of the church as well, not just individualistic. Because he works good to wants to bring us together, his church to be presented holy and blameless before the Lord. This is, what, again, what I wish. I, 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 I just need to reach out to, like, Zondervan or Lifeway or those. And we need a southern Bible, okay? So we know when it's a you or a y'all, okay? Because it, 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 as, as a Bible scholar and, and a guy who loves the Greek, to me that is so stinking important to know if it's a plural you or not. Because in our, in our individualistic society, we take those views as singular. Just taking it to a point, uh, Colossians 122. And by the way, a little tip, if I'm calling out these references, unless you're an expert Bible, Bible flipper, just write the reference down. Don't try to flip it, because then you won't, you'll stop listening to me and lose the train of thought. So just write the reference down and, and listen, and unless you're, you're an expert Bible flipper, if you can flip like that. Yeah, so this first verse is Colossians 1.22. Colossians 1.22. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach, reproach before him. Now this is a one, if we read it individualistic, in order to present you. But that's a plural you. So Christ has reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present y'all... Holy and blameless and above reports before God, Him, God the Father. Jude uh, 24. Jude verse 24. Remember, there's no chapters in Jude. So Jude 24. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. Those are now to keep you all from stumbling and to present y'all blameless before the presence. So when he works together for good, don't, it's awesome. I mean, it is kind of on an individualistic side. Yes, he wants to work everything good for his purpose for you to be able to present you holy and blameless before the Lord. But there's also the corporate side of it. All of us as a church, as a group, that we are in there as well. So we think about it. You know, we sometimes we have those hard times we go through, right? I mean, you know, I'll often ask God, why? Why? Why did I have to go through this? Well, as, you know, as a single person, I mean, I'll, I'll say generically, and I can almost always say, God is trying to draw you closer to him in some way. Mm-hmm. You know, in some area of your life, he's allowing this trial to bring you closer to him. And that's the good on the individualistic side. Now, the corporate side is you've gone through a trial. And you've healed from it. God has brought you through it. And amazing things happen. And down the road, it may be a week, maybe months, maybe years, you run into someone who is going through the same thing. Now, what is the good that can be done as a group? Is that you can come alongside and say, I went through that very same thing. We can come alongside and bear one of the burdens. And that good can be worked out for the, for the whole church. Yeah. For, the, for everyone, not just us ourselves. So God allows those trials to grow us individualistically too, but also that we can help one another. Because that's one of the other things. When you go through those trials, I mean, sin and the enemy, they, they, they don't want us to think we're the only ones that have ever gone through that. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> there is no new sin under uh, here. It's, it, any sin that's ever been done has already been done. The Christians have already gone through it and been healed from it. And so if we're stuck in those sins, the best thing we can do is say, hey, I'm struggling with it. And guess what? Someone will pop up and say, hey, amen. I was just going through that last year. Let me pray for you. Let me help you. Let me come alongside you and bear one another burdens together. That's how the good is worked out for everybody. So you see both components there on working out, the, uh, working uh, all things together for his good for us. That's a very good, encouraging verse we have there. Okay, we're past the easy stuff. Now we're going to get into the, okay, okay, we're getting ready to work. Okay, so every, everyone got your, your theological hats? 
You got your theological hard hat to protect you. All right? You got, got your work gloves on. All right? We're going to dive in. Because here we go. He works together all for good for those who were called according to his purpose. Those who are called, it means uh, to be summoned to, um, and to, to be brought before someone, and then to be given something. You're called to, you're summoned before someone to be given something. And of course, in this case, he, you're called before you know, God to be given salvation. They're called according to his purpose. And this called according to his purpose is, is actually verses 23 and 20, and, uh, 29 and 30. We're going to expound on what, what is his purpose. What, what's going to happen to those who are called. That's when we get to the last point. It's a very simple point. We were chosen by God. We were chosen by by God is our last point there. But we're going to spend a lot of time on it. So, of course, this expounds upon what it means to be called according to his purpose. That's over 29 and 30 or 4. Just starting off. For those whom he foreknew. Those he foreknew. It means he knew in advance. Uh, he, he selected in advance. And, and, and this is more of... Uh, than just merely knowing or selecting. I remember back in grade school uh, during recess, we'd uh, always go out and play like flag football. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like in some of those, you know, if, if I was selected as a team captain, you know, like going out to recess, mm-hmm. I'd already know if like if I won the rock, paper, scissors, who I was picking first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that's not the level of what this is talking mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. This is in addition to, to, to knowing in advance and selecting in advance, there's a relationship, a knowing uh, between the two of what's going on here. For those whom he foreknew, uh, and this isn't new. I mean, we hear about this back in the, the Old Testament. Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah 1.5. When he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Which means to set apart, to make holy. So this is even this isn't something new uh, to God. It's even in the Old Testament. He knew and had a relationship with. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. He, he was decided beforehand, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Th- this is really what salvation is about here. Is that now we are, have the ability to, to, to want to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus, to be able to act like Jesus. Ever thought about that? With the Spirit in us, now we're able to kind of act like Jesus. We're not divine or anything, but we have the ability to act like Jesus. We have the ability to follow Him, and, the, and eventually, what? We'll have the redeemed, glorified body that Jesus currently has. Um, and that's how, when it gets into, uh, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Jesus was the firstborn. He was the form of the first glorified body. And he rose again in his glorified body. He set the example of how it's going to be. So when we, we receive our glorified bodies, we'll be, I'll be among many brothers, men and women. This is the fellow saints in Christ. That's the example for us. To be conformed to the image of his son. And he continues on in verse 30. So if you've been foreknown, if you've been predestined, then there's three steps that verse 30 lays out. They're going to happen. And he says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Same word used before. Called to be summoned to, to be, to be given salvation. And this is a call that cannot be re- uh, resisted. It cannot be refused if you've been called. Uh, kind of the, the key here is irresistible grace, if you've ever heard this. And, and this isn't the only place we find this in the Bible. Paul writes about it in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.9. 1 Corinthians 1.9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of a son. Colossians 3.15. Colossians 3.15. 
And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. So we're, we're called, we're, we're summoned before the Lord to be given salvation. He also called and those whom he called, he also justified. So if he says, hey, by the way, I'm giving you salvation, he's going to say, I'm, I'm justifying you too. Remember, that's what the whole uh, uh, first part of Romans is about. It's about justification. How can we be made right with God? From the unrighteous to now being righteous before God, being right before God, how can that happen? That's what we've been, we've nailed that, you know, we beat that horse dead. I'm not saying that right. <laughs> we beat that dead horse, if I can say that. Yeah. <laughs> My mind isn't thinking. We, we, that is all about justification. And honestly, we really can't beat that enough. It needs to be something we need to be reminded of. So if you're called, you're justified. Now, what's the last step? And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. Now, this is, you guys notice a little weird thing about how he wrote it? Glorified is in the past tense. Has anybody here been glorified yet? No. 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 We're talking about future glorified bodies or future resurrection. So, you know, wait, why is he writing this in the past? Why is this in the past tense? Yeah, that's well, a question. Well, uh, remember in the, in the Greek, they don't have past tenses. It's, it's an aorist tense. But it, how it's being used is it's so certain. It's absolutely certain it's going to happen. It's written in this tense. So even the, so don't be thrown off that it's an, in the past tense. It's the fact that, that it's, it's so certain it's going to happen. He just went ahead and wrote it in past tense. Because it doesn't matter. But it's still a future glorification that happened when we get our new bodies and we're with Christ. It is a done deal. You've been called, you've been justified, and you will be glorified. Amen. It's done. It's a done deal. Now, there are some hard things. I know people have some obje objections to this. It can be, kind of be you know, kind of hard to swallow. When it was, well, where's our free will fit into this? If, if we've been foreknown and predestined, you know, and how, how can I how wrap my head around this? I just can't logically think it through. It doesn't make sense. And, and, and I'll be honest, but one of the biggest reasons I've heard to not hold to predestination and foreknowledge is simply that they can't wrap their minds around it. People saying, that's a dangerous route to go down. If you're refuting a, a, a pretty obvious doctrine just because you can't understand it, that, that's a very dangerous slippery slope. Because <laughs> there's going to be stuff we can't wrap our minds around of, but it's in the Bible. You know, we've been spending the last eight weeks talking about the, the Trinity, right? We can't fully accurately, you know, describe and understand the Trinity. We, we can try. We've gotten better over the last eight weeks, but we still can't, you know? And just because we can't wrap our minds around it doesn't mean we say, oh, it doesn't exist. That, we don't do that. So we, we can't take that approach with predestination. We say, ah, oh, just, I can't understand it, so I'm not going to hold to it. It's like, well, Lord, it's there. I don't know how to go around it, but it's there. You know, so that, that might be, but you can't refute it just because we can't understand it. Um, as we've listed other places where this doctrine is about being called, right? Uh, Paul writes about it again in Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, 3 through 5, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So this isn't an isolated little thing. That it's just there that Paul writes about quite a bit about being predestined. So, so just because we can't wrap our minds around it, don't, don't hold to it just because of that. Um, now let's talk a little bit about free will. Um, now, in this, I'm not going to talk about to what extent God has predestined and ordained each and every day of our lives. That, that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about that God has predestined, he's ordained, Who's going to be saved and who isn't? That's literally what predestination is. So I'm, I'm not going to get into, you know, 
God has ordained that I'm going to step now. And I'm not going to get into that. But more on the lines of salvation. That there's some that God has said are going to be saved. Some that aren't. Uh, and that's what I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to scope on. So first we talk about free will. We actually need to have an accurate definition of free will first. Free, an accurate, a good definition is the freedom to act according to our nature. The, the, the freedom to choose according to our nature. Now, when we were born, what is our nature? Sin. Sinners. Mm-hmm. Did anybody ever feel inhibited from sinning in their life? No. 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 I think we had pretty good free will, didn't we? <laughs> Our nature was sinning and we sinned, right? Even if we try to be good people, we still really are sinning. We are. But then, the Holy Spirit gets involved. And if you, and just as a little, uh, truly understand salvation. I mean, we read earlier in Romans where it says, no one seeks after God. No, not one. And so the, the, the sequence of salvation is that the Holy Spirit comes into us. And regenerates our heart so that we can actually seek out God. Because in our sinful hearts, we, have, we don't have the capability of reaching out to God. But with the Holy Spirit coming in and giving us the ability to reach out to God, then we can reach out to God, see our need for salvation, then we are saved. So there has to be a little bit of the Holy Spirit working before salvation. So the Spirit comes in, changes our heart, which and then changes our nature. And now as the Spirit's working on our heart, and it comes to that point of choosing salvation, we choose it because that's all we want, right? It's in our nature to now want to be saved. You know, there's nothing holding us back because the Spirit has changed us. You know, it's kind of like, I remember as a kid, you know, we were always told, just say no to drugs, right? That was hammered into us over and over again, just say no to drugs, you know, and so, so then, you know, the first time you get into high school or wherever it might be where someone offers you a cigarette or some other drugs, wh- what's your response? No. Because that's what's been hammered into, right? Your, your nature on that's kind of been changed so that when it's offered to you, but your main response is no. You know, is, is that inhibiting your free will by that you've been trained to say that? No. no that, that's, you're freely choosing to say no because there's some people that are hammered into it and they still choose to do drugs. It's... That's not a, a not, it's not inhibiting free will. So the Spirit comes in, changes our heart, and gives us the freedom to choose God because that's what we want. So if, using a free will argument, we've got to truly have a good definition of what free will is. To freely choose according to our nature. Okay? Uh, and an, an, another point on this, that predestination has to be a, a, a good... Uh, doctrine to have is God's sovereignty. I think a lot of us can agree God is sovereign. Right? Mm-hmm. God is all powerful. He's all knowing. Mm-hmm. And if it's truly up to the creature to decide whether or not to accept Christ, that takes away from God's sovereignty. Because <laughs> now God, as the sovereign king, isn't even able to control who enters his, his kingdom. So in that way, predestination is revealing the sovereignty of God. You see, he's got to be sovereign over his kingdom, the kingdom of God, to allow people to come in. That's why he's predestined those who are going to come in. If it's truly we have the freedom of choice to, 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 to accept God whenever we want, then we're, we're usurping the sovereignty of God by thinking we can get into his kingdom without God's permission. <laughs> and again, it's a dangerous slope to go down. And lastly, uh, one last ob- objection. Because if God has just predestined us, aren't we just robots? <laughs> I'll, I'll be asked this, and then, then this is, I mean, aren't we just doing what we're called to do? Well, last one here. For those who have been called and have given your life to Christ, have you ever felt like a robot? Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> so this argument, I mean, if you, if you ask a Christian, you truth those God, and you ask him, have you ever felt like a robot? That's well, eh, kind of not good. Yes, God has already chosen those who will be saved. But we've got to understand that that decision 
is like on such a high level. I mean, that it really doesn't impact us in our day-to-day living. Yes, God has chosen who's going to be saved and who's not. Does anyone have insight into that? <laughs> does, does anyone have uh, God's little uh, roll of deck to figure out who's going to be <laughs> saved? No, we don't. So, so we still experience free will in making our decisions, even though God has already mandated salvation for some and not for others. And there's also, we, we got to remember, there's supposed to be a tension here. Remember, we're, we're Western thinkers, right? We like things black or white. You're, you're, you're either for predestination or free will. You, know, you can't be both. But is our Bible a Western document? No, it's an Eastern document. They aren't black and white. They allow things to be in tension. So Paul is black and white here that, you know, saying that God has predestined those to his call. But if there's not a free will, that's a woodpecker we got on the church. Oh. Uh, <laughs> there's there's uh, several of them destroying the church right now. <laughs> but, um, so he's making it black and white here, being predestined. And so if you're saying, well, if, we're be, if, we're be, if we've been predestined, how in the world do we have free will? I would say, yes, we have both. Because if there's not free will, then why in the world do we have the Bible? <laughs> why in the world earlier does, does Paul talk about the struggle between choosing two masters, sin or, or righteousness? Right? If it's if it's if there's no free will, then then why write that? Why write about choosing between righteousness and sin if there's no free will? So I'm not going to be a Western thinker here. I'm going to be an Eastern thinker and say God is sovereign. He has predestined us, but He's also got free will. So they're both there. Okay. So hope they're not mutually exclusive. They work. Together there. They work in tandem together. So hold that God is sovereign. We must hold that he has chosen those he will save. But in the daily living out of our lives and in our decisions we make, there is still free will according to our nature. Whether it be our nature as sinners or as redeemed sinners. Another thing is, can we choose? Who, can we know who he has chosen to be saved? No. I mean, we cannot be like, nah, I don't want to share him. He's not, he's, not, he's not one of the elect. He's, he's not one of the cool guys. No. I mean, we don't know that. So we still go out there and share the gospel and we love people because we have no idea of knowing. It's pretty much our free will is choice. Yeah. But a choice according to our nature. So that's where if you're redeemed, you have the spirit in you, your free will is going to be made in accordance with your new nature as the son of God. Not as a sinner, you know. And that's the other thing we're going to take into it. When it says, you know, pray anything you want and God will give it to you. People like pray for a Lamborghini. Well, if you're a son of God, you're not going to be praying for a new car or a new Lamborghini. You're going to be praying in accordance with his will. Um, anyway, I don't want to go off on that rabbit. But anyway, what I like about now, I'm going to talk about now is this is a huge theological thing to bring up here. It was predestination. But I want us to think about the context. Doesn't it seem a little weird to bring up this hugely theological topic in the middle of giving us hope and encouragement, forgiving through our struggles, yeah. forgiving us, you know, hope that the Spirit's praying for us and God's going to work all, th- all things good um, according to His good for us? Well, now wh- why talk about predestination? Well, the context is key <laughs> to know why this is such a good thing here. In, in the context of, of sufferings, in, in the context of groanings, in the, in the context of our, of our weakness, of, of, of hoping uh, things will work out for our good, uh, things we need uh, when we see things, you know, when we see things going to hell in a handbasket, or when we see things are going crazy on Things are falling out apart and we're crying out, Lord, what, what, what's happening? Lord, Lord, why? When... <coughs> Sorry. When we're, you know, in, in in the deepest parts of the abyss, and we're just going, Lord, what's happening, Lord? I, I don't see you. When when we're when we're crying out, Lord, do you even love me, Lord? Are you still there? 
That's when this is key. Because when all that's going to crap around you, that's when we can read, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And that's talking about the very start of creation. He foreknew. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among his brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those who he called, he also justified. Those whom he also justified, he glorified. This, these are facts. These are ifs or maybes. And it might happen. It will happen. So we're in the midst of those sufferings. And, and we're going, why God? I, I don't see you working. I, I don't feel you. Where are you? We can turn and say, wait. I am a son of God. And he has justified me. He's called me and he will glorify me. These are concrete facts. These aren't maybes. These are certainties. And that's why in a preview of next week, when we can jump down to verse 38 and 39, in the midst of the, of the concrete knowing that God is sovereign, he has called, he has justified, he will glorify us. That's when we can read in verse 38 and 39, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ. Because they can't do it because God has ordained it from the beginning of creation that you are to be his child. And nothing can take that away. Nothing. That's why it's hope for us. Not just a doctrine, not just something a head knowledge is. Hope. And concrete hope. So for those who love God, the Spirit prays with us. For those who love God, all things will work together for His good in us. For those who love God, know that you were chosen before time began. And nothing is going to change that fact. We will be glorified with him in the future. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this glorious hope. We thank you, Lord, for this amazing truth. That's not just a hard doctrinal thing to understand, but it's a source of hope in our life. Lord, thank you. Oh, Lord. Sometimes it's just great to think about your sovereignty. To think about how you ordain things. And we love you. But we can choose you, Lord, because you have first chosen us. But we can love because you first loved us. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.